delayed gratification is one of those problems so grand that it isn't categorized as being strictly a political issue, but more so a life's meaning issue. This is a pretty easy distinction to make considering the political issues are almost exclusively discussed by the usual pundits, but a life issue is profound enough that it lays itself in the hands of gurus, the likes of Alan Watts, who is called waiting for time to fix things, a type of thinking for suckers. Now, I know that by mentioning Alan Watts, some of you might be afraid that this will get too wishy-washy and abstract, but here's how I'll nail things down for this conversation. My interest with the concept of delayed gratification is how it manifests as unique types of negative thinking in both left and right-leaning people, as well as talking about the good and bad kinds of delayed gratification. I've talked with plenty of leftists over the years, and it isn't uncommon to find ones that are suicidal over whether or not socialism is achievable within their lifetimes. They've become so enthralled in the material conditions of everything that they don't want to imagine living in late-stage capitalism for the rest of their lives. Sometimes they like betting on when everything will finally collapse. The next election? A decade? Two of them? It seems nonsensical to have such a discussion, but by guessing when it'll occur, it implies a higher level of confidence in collapse happening in the first place. It's an odd kind of catharsis for those who worry they won't be around to see the new world be born. There's another kind of implication with this way of thinking that's rooted in an unhealthy form of delayed gratification. The underlying thought, beneath all the betting, all the suicidality, is the feeling that we aren't allowed to have fun until the revolution happens. That we have to put off all of our enjoyment until socialism. We're like kids in a hot, uncomfortable car on the way to summer vacation, but with no parents in the front to ask when we'll be there. I can empathize. Waiting is one of the most painful things we can do, especially when the future is so vaporous and incapable of being grasped. Even as a leftist worried about the future myself, I cannot begin to care about the when anymore. My life and even the world can change so drastically in just one year that I don't dare guess if it will end in another three or five or more. Everyone seems to forget that in the midst of increasing instability, our capabilities of mapping out how good or bad the future may look are almost completely out the window. I think part of this leftist-flavored delayed gratification comes from a hyperfixation on material conditions. We know that they're the most important factor in our day-to-day -day lives, and that we also have little control over them. That said, happiness is a pretty general term. Sure, in a post-capitalist world, you'd be happier being able to go to bed not thinking about debt. You'd be happier never having to worry about making enough to live. You'd be happier knowing the economy isn't going to flop around and make previously straightforward things a nightmare. This kind of happiness is content it's the ability to feel content with your current conditions and your ability to supply your needs. While this passive kind of happiness is very much in the hands of material conditions, there is also active happiness. Even with your needs met and your financial worries brushed away, you will not suddenly learn how to have fun. That is something you can do regardless of material conditions, and is something a revolution won't fix for you. I have plenty of friends who pack their time with work and school. It's the first thing they mention when they say they have a bad day, and damn near all these people haven't taken up a hobby. They haven't found things to do with their free time, no matter how much or little of it they have. And really, it's the same problem. I'm not allowed to have fun because of my material conditions. I'll be able to have fun when they get better. This is a shorter term version of the same waiting until the revolution problem. I assure you, there is always room in the world for fun. You get better at making this fun when you stop waiting for something to happen, as if you need to be given permission to make fun. That's why this grandiose issue of delayed gratification is life's cruelest joke. Some people will spend their entire lives continually waiting for permission to have fun, and then they die. We grow up as kids thinking we'll finally be allowed to have fun when we graduate and have the freedom of adults. Then as adults, we tell ourselves we'll finally be allowed to have fun when we land the good job that pays us enough to do all of our hobbies and have more time off. Then, as those who've been in the workforce for decades, we tell ourselves that we'll finally be allowed to have fun when we get to retirement and have all the time in the world to do what we want. You've seen old retired folks. They go on a few vacations, and then they run out of all those grand things to do they save for retirement. They get lonely and bored. They start fixating on all these different tedious things because they have nothing to do. I promise you that if you allow yourself to think that you need to wait for a time to have more fun, you'll either be waiting forever, or when you finally do get there, wherever it is, you'll realize that you don't know how to have true, active fun. Speaking of retirees, let's talk about their flavor of delayed gratification. Obviously, Grandpa didn't end up waiting until retirement and not knowing how to have fun because he was a lifelong commie. No, these people are usually sold on a different flavor of delayed delayed gratification. Sometimes, life's biggest lies are laid on a foundation of common sense. See, delayed gratification can be a good thing, and it's a part of growing up. If you ask a kid to sit in a room with nothing to do and a marshmallow on their plate, and tell them that if they can wait five minutes, they'll get another one, they're immensely more likely to just eat the one in front of them instead of being capable of waiting like an older person who has a better grasp of delaying gratification for a reward. This understanding usually comes with how we handle money as adults. We learn to save for the future so we're not screwed during a rainy day. We learn that skipping some 
coffees or fancy meals means we can buy ourselves something nice later with the money we save. It makes us more capable of waiting for that second marshmallow in five minutes compared to the little kid who's never had to think about money. That's the idea that was sold to many right-leaning boomers. Whenever the economy was shaky due to recessions and Reaganomics, they were told that if they waited patiently, the riches would eventually come in, that the tides would eventually raise their boats too. It's the idea that you're never really poor, but instead a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. The rich have convinced people that waiting eternity for a tide that will never come is exactly the same as waiting five minutes for that marshmallow, and that you don't need to listen to all those young leftists that tell you it's a sham because they're just not old enough yet to understand delayed gratification. They're too young to know how the real world works. And I'm sure you've heard that phrase plenty of times if you tried to explain your leftist lens on the world to your conservative parents. I know I have. The problem is that I'm not trying to convince people that waiting sometimes for a better thing later is a bad thing. I'm trying to convince people that waiting their entire lives for those good things will absolutely leave them with deep regrets on their deathbed. The common one is always about how one should have spent more time having fun instead of working, and that they only did that because they thought that if they worked hard and waited, they'd be able to have fun later. It literally takes being three steps from death's door to realize you've been tricked, and by then, it's too late. Your greatest enemy doesn't have to fight you if they've already convinced you not to advocate for your best interests. And you won't do that if you're delaying happiness behind an infinite set of qualifiers. Really, rebellion doesn't start with a protest or canvassing, it starts in the mind. Just as I described in my video on the myth of wasted time, there's a capitalist in your head that has turned you into your own exploiter. It convinces you that you need to be intensely efficient with your time, and that you need to delay gratification forever. In a world built with the purpose of keeping us unhappy and thus profitable, we have to laugh in the face of this absurdity and say, fuck it, I'm gonna be happy anyways. We have to be capable of killing the capitalist on our heads to feel the catharsis of being able to simply exist without humiliation. Breaking free from these mental shackles makes it easier to help others do the same, and that's an act of rebellion anyone is capable of. It's important to remind ourselves, as continually as necessary, that we do not exist to be profitable. We exist for lazy afternoons and time with friends. We exist to enjoy and make art. We exist to be happy. Nobody should have to earn their existence or push down what makes them feel human in this world to save it for later if that place and time is ever really allowed to exist. Eventually, we have to learn to live unashamedly with happiness. We either do it, or we die regretting it. I know I put this all so bluntly, and that it seems like a simple thing, but to create a sound mind, we have to remove the foundations of destructive thinking before we can truly internalize new ideas that liberate us all.